Good morning. A lot of grumpy kids today. Did any of you wake up grumpy this morning? There's not honest people in this room. Goodness. We're going to study Romans chapter 3. Too much feedback here? You want me to move? Is that better? Probably not. Um, I had a lot that I was going to go over with you, but then God like changes it. I, I don't know if I like it when he does that or not, but you got to be obedient, you know? And so, I don't know if you remember or not, but two weeks ago I started with uh, a little bit overview of Romans. And if you remember the little drawing I had up here, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Maybe that's better. So we had kind of three groups. Paul's writing this letter to Rome, okay? And it's, it's people that had, had, had been established as a church, okay? And he's writing it to them. And, and he was writing it to them because he was concerned with some things that they were doing, some behavior, okay? Now, in this group over here, you had the Jews for Jesus. Okay, you with me? And over here, we had the Gentiles or slash Greeks for Jesus. You with me? And then we had this big pool over here of no to... Jesus. And that include some Jews and some Gentiles, right? Okay. Now, the problem that was happening is that, and I'll give you an example. Do you remember when, and we just went through the book of Acts, and there's several places in Acts where we find the same dilemma. Okay. First one was when Peter was um, had the vision on the roof, remember? And then these people came to him, and then he went to them, and, and he was talking to these non-Jews, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, and they were baptized. And Peter realized, right, that God, that Jesus and God, you know, that salvation wasn't just for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles as well, Right? Then there's also a place in Acts where Paul kind of opposes Peter. Do you remember that one? Peter had been hanging out with some of the Gentiles and doing some things and, and, and associating with them, the believers. But then when some of the other Jews came, Peter started to withdraw and not kind of associate with them as much, right? And Paul kind of called him out on it. You with me? And so what's really interesting to me is in this dynamic or this letter, and then I started going a little bit over some of the other letters, and we'll look at it a little bit that Paul wrote, but the problem what was happening is, is that the Jews for Jesus began to start to tell these non-Jews that they needed to start doing some things that the law requires for them to have a relationship and a faith walk with Jesus, like circumcision, that was the big one, all right? And so what Paul is, 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 is trying to address here is, is the core element, the core, the fundamental element that, that, that everyone is kind of neglecting, all right? And we can go into just all kinds of study into this and, and why Paul is doing this and, and how he goes about doing it, but, but God kind of wants me to take it just a little bit of a different direction today. And so we're going to do both, I guess. But the core element is, is this right here, okay? And, and this is pretty simple. It is Jesus. And so when I say the core element is Jesus, what happened is, is that every single one of these groups that are for Jesus, they came to Jesus when they reached the end of themselves. Okay? And they understood that they 
were, were lost and they needed this Savior. That they were, they were standing or, or they were falling in their sinfulness. And it was nothing that they did to earn that salvation. Correct? Jesus is the one that paid the price for that. It was the grace of God and the mercy of God that brought them in. That's where they started. But what has happened in this church in Rome is that all of a sudden, as they kind of walked on this journey and, and they continued to build on this journey and this, this faith walk, they, they started to uh, surround themselves with, with things that they were doing. You follow that? Or the things that they had done, like this, this circumcision or the tithing or, or maybe it was the, the going to church or the reading of the Bible or the praying or the fasting or, or all of these things. These different disciplines or, or, or rules or things to follow. And those are all good and those are all important. But those are not what paid the price for our sin and brought us into the relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ and gave us eternal life. Does that, does that make sense? Are you following me there? Okay. They started saying, well, I have earned this. I have attained this. And so, so there's this great big elephant in, in, in the room or in the world that we, we, we sometimes tend to ignore. I don't know if this looks like an elephant or not, but we're going to try. Okay. Okay. Are you with me? Does it kind of look like an elephant? Huh? Are we getting pretty good there? Are we getting close? Okay. It's an elephant. Okay. It's all right, right? What's that, man? It's a pig with a big nose, yes, that's right. Um, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and they partook of the fruit, of the tree of the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. And, and, I, and you've heard me say this some, but God wants to hear it again today. We, we, we sometimes forget that there was two parts to that. It's pretty easy for us to acknowledge that that disobedience, sinfulness, evil, came into our being. Us as mortal beings were not created. Mortal beings were not created to have the knowledge of evil, but we're not also created to have the knowledge of good. Okay? That, 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 that's, our, that's the nature that we have inherited. We were born with that nature. It doesn't just go away. And, and I'm going to tell you, when, when Jesus died on the cross, and, and then when Jesus rose again, that nature didn't go away. But it created a way so that I too could be created, crucified in my flesh and be resurrected to a new life, a new creation and house an immortal spirit, the Holy Spirit. Are you following me on that? And have within me an immortal spirit that can overcome the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil until the day that I go to be with the Father. So the wrestling that takes place in you and I, the wrestling every day, you want to know why we're studying Romans 3? It's a letter that, you know, that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. Why are we studying it? What does it matter? Well, what matters is, is that just because we aren't in Rome several hundred years ago, 
Just because we're not a Gentile or a Greek, according to the book of Romans, just because we're maybe not a no to Jesus, or maybe we're not a Jew for Jesus, the fact of the matter is, is that the whole dynamic and everything that the people in these groups were wrestling with and struggling with is stuff that you and I wrestle and struggle with today. And, and unfortunately, I think this one is a big one. You see, we have a very, very strong, strong inner desire in this old nature to be God. To be our own God. I mean, just take a snapshot of your own self and just ask yourself, are there things in your life? Oh, no, let me go this direction. When you judge someone else, you with me? What are you judging them based on? Yourself. And what else? The things that you think are the right things to do. Correct? Correct? Are we perfect? Have we arrived? Have we attained? No. But, like the Jews for Jesus. Well, we were, I, I'm circumcised, right? Or I, uh, I read my Bible. Or I go to church. Um, I tithe. I pray. I fast. I, I think I'm nice to people. And, and so, we kind of create this checklist in our lives of the things that we feel are validating or have attained or maintained this gift of salvation. That was a gift. right? It was a gift. I didn't earn it. I didn't attain it. And so this letter, Paul... You know, if I, 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 I walk with a lot of people, I, I, I observe lots of people, and, 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 and Paul is really, really good at, at, at working with people and trying to bring people together. Okay? He's really, really good at it because the, the first thing that he does is, is he comes to the Jews. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 3 with me, please do that. He starts off in chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in, in, in circumcision? He says, Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. Okay? So that's really cool. Now, listen as I go jump back to Genesis 17. Okay? That's way back there, but you're going to have to trust me on this. And just listen as I read here. And I'm in Genesis 17, and this is the covenant of circumcision. And we're going to start at verse 3. Abram okay, fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. Okay, This isn't Abram going to God and making a deal. This is God coming to Abram. Okay, Is this something Abram earned? Is this something Abram desired or is this something Abram asked for is this something that Abram you know should just get no this is God coming coming to all of us through Abram okay and God says this as for me this is my covenant with you you will be the father of many nations no longer will you be called Abram your name will be Abraham for I have made you a father of many nations I will make you very fruitful I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God." 
Then, Abram, then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offering, offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people and has broken my covenant. Okay, that is this covenant that... What was God trying to do through calling of Abram? He was choosing a people to be set apart. Okay? To be different. And the covenant, the physical covenant that he chose to, to exemplify that is the act of circumcision. Okay? And so, we're, we're jumping a long time later and these Jews who are for Jesus are now saying, well, it's, it's not just because Jesus died on the cross and that God forgave me of my sins and that I've received the Holy Spirit that I have salvation. It's now because now I'm going to go back to all this stuff, all of these old covenant things and all of these things. And, and those are going to be the things that we are now going to require the non-Jews that believe in Jesus to do. And if you don't, you're not as good as we are. Can we fast forward to 2024? Do we do that? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I would love for you to follow Jesus. I would love for you to, to ask him to forgive you of your sins. But the first thing I want you to do is jump through this hoop and then I want you to go over this hurdle and then I want you to go around this mountain and then once you go through these flames, then... Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you, you follow what I'm saying, right? What did you do? Answer me this question. What did you do to be able to go to heaven. What did you do? <laughs> okay. That's what I did. That was it. Confess my sins. So Paul's writing this letter, this whole book of Romans, and he's writing it specifically to this group. And, and we're going to get into some really deep stuff if we want to as we go through. But he's taking all of them back to this old covenant stuff. This stuff in the law. And he's not trying to make it useless. But he's trying to show that Jesus was the fulfillment of that. Okay? What's really interesting to me is we go on in Romans... And it says, what if some didn't have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? I'm in verse 4. Not at all. Let God be true, and every man a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak, and prevail when you judge. Now that's a quote, and that's coming from Psalm 51. How many of you know what is found in Psalm 51? Dennis, you quoted it this morning in, in men's Bible study. What, what is Psalm 51? Does anybody know off the top of their head? Exactly. Yeah, he's pouring out saying, man, I am a loser. I am a sinner. Now, if you would ask these, Rome, these Jews here about the reign of David, what would their response have been? Yes! That's what we want it to be like. The good old days, right? And everything was great. And everything was unified. We were all one. And God was great. And King was great. And everything was good. Right? And so... Paul is so, so wise, 
So, so where does Paul go? He goes straight to the heart. Remember David? Remember David, the one that was the one after God's heart? Remember David? What was the posture of David in Psalm 51? I am a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me. Remember, a great song comes out of that. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew in me a right spirit. Cast not your spirit from me. Right? All this stuff. And so, so Paul is kind of coming back door to the Jews rather than just saying, you guys need to knock it off. That's not important. He's coming back to the root the foundation of everything, and he's coming to the Jews and he's saying, look, look even at King David. When we thought the, the kingdom was perfect and it was wonderful and everything was good, look at him. And even David was not worthy of the gift of Jesus Christ. Even David. And look at his heart here when he had sinned against Bathsheba. Well, we move on a little bit here in Romans chapter 3. And Paul goes on in verse 5. He says, But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? And Paul, in quotations or parentheses here, says, I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood or my sin enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? <laughs> Fast forward to 2024. <laughs> People live this way. We do this. Don't we? Yes, we do. When we miss... This part, where Jesus is at the center, and that Jesus is at the core. And we begin to kind of create around us the things... I can't get that off. When I start to make my own checklist of the things that I do that I feel validate and have attained and earned and maintained my relationship and my faithfulness and, and, and my salvation, then I'm replacing Jesus with me. And then I begin to rationalize and, 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 and all those kind of things like, well, you know, I'm a sinner, and I'm, you know, Jesus will forgive me and, and my forgiveness. And, and that's what was happening here. I think I broke my glasses. Sorry. Broke the pen, too. Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result, their condemnation is deserved? In verse 9 it says, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. Did you hear that one? Did you hear that? Paul's trying to get everyone to understand. That is an equal sign. Does that make sense? What's the difference between these? What's the difference? Jesus. I follow Jesus or I don't. I believe in Jesus or I don't. That's the only difference. I find it really interesting that all of a sudden now here, verse 9 through 20, Paul starts just using different scripture. 
Scripture over and over and over. Scripture over and over and over to set the precedent to help the to help these people understand who they really are. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not telling us today that we need to walk around like... <laughs> okay? It's not what I'm saying. Are you following me? Okay? I'm not saying that. There, there are some definitions that we need to go over. Okay? Um, humility. Humility. What is the definition of humility? My definition of humility. Is it okay if we use my definition since I'm talking? Okay. Is understanding. I'm just going to put this. Understanding who I am without Jesus. And without Jesus, I'm going to hell. Is that a fair assessment? Without Jesus, I'm going to hell. Okay? Confidence is who I am in with Jesus. Okay? Now here's the one. Pride is thinking I'm something without Jesus. Okay? Any? We are good on that? It's important for us to understand this, okay? I am not telling us, Paul's not addressing confidence in Christ. What Paul is addressing is pride. Paul is addressing pride. Allowing us to think we're something without Jesus. That we have attained something, we have approved something, that we've, we've earned something, or that we're, we've practiced and practiced and we are really good without Jesus. Because that's what was happening here. They were thinking that the law that they were following, the, the, the things that they were doing, the obedience of theirs, was causing them to be better, or be something. And they were losing sight of this whole humility thing that says we are no different than anyone else other than Jesus. But look at the scriptures he says here. And we'll go over them here, starting in verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. No, not even one. And that is found in Psalms 1, or Psalm 14. And then it goes on. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. And that is found in Psalm 5. The poison of vipers is on their lips. That is found in Psalm 1, I think. Psalm 140, excuse me. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. That is found in Psalm 10. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. That is found in Isaiah 59. And then there, oh, where did it go? There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is found in Psalm 36. There, yeah. So look at that. He's writing this letter and he's giving them all the stuff from the same stuff that they're trying to, I guess, build their own little kingdom or their own little platform or their own little pedestal. And he's saying, look, this is what the law says. This is what the scripture says. This is what the word says. Nobody's good. Nobody's righteous. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. I love how Paul comes to the back door on this. Rather than just coming face to face with them and just saying, you dummy, you know? He's like, look, these are the very scriptures that you're trying to build your pedestal on. And what does it truly say about you? What does it truly say about us? It says that we are nothing without Jesus. And that we are truly going to fall if we think we are something without Jesus. The fact of the matter is, is that in Jesus we should have confidence and boldness because we are now children 
of God. And that is enough, and that is all. That is everything. In verse 21, Paul kind of goes on a different course. He starts talking about this big word called righteousness. And for me, righteousness is this whole premise of being set apart. You know, from the very beginning, the whole purpose of the law, which is gonna, we're going to read about here, was not for us to be given a, a, a step-by-step manual of checklist of things to, to do that would earn us the cleansing and the purification and, and the right to become children of God and have salvation. But that's what it kind of got looked at as. The whole purpose of the law was to show us how far away from God we were, to show us the separation, to show us the need of, of a Savior. And Jesus became that. And Jesus himself said, I didn't come to abolish that law. I came to fulfill it because you cannot. But I can, and I did. And we can then, in this righteousness, be set apart. Circumcision was was a physical, outward thing that set these people apart from other people. Right? With Jesus in our lives, are we set apart? Dave, you said emphatically yes. But what I want to ask is ask yourself, am I different? Am I different? Yeah, Chris, you're really different. (laughs) Are you different? Eric, are you different as a teacher? Tim, are you different as a coach? Steve, are you different as a farmer? Cody, are you different as a police officer? Vince, are you different? Are we different? Are we different? In what way are we different? What sets you apart? Does the way that you act, the way that you talk, the way that you react, the way that you respond or don't respond, does it show Jesus that you're different? One of the things for me that I've noticed is that I, as I've tried to be more intentional of, of being out around people that aren't just in my own little circle but maybe are out here, is that a lot of people that don't believe as I believe don't do the same things that I believe. I, I, forgiveness isn't really the first option. You follow me? Or kindness isn't really a good option. I don't fit in. I stick out like a sore thumb. But aren't we supposed to stick out like a sore thumb? Is it okay to be different? How many of you like being different? Do we know that Jesus suffered on a cross? And he bled and died so that we would be set apart and be different. Jeff shared this morning that he doesn't feel like he fits in. 
in that kind of, I mean, that was my take on it. If that's not the way you intended it, I apologize. I don't feel like I fit in either. But when I don't feel like I fit in, is it, do I then just surround myself with all of these parameters that kind of keep me like secure and don't let anybody else in? Yeah, it's kind of a tendency, sometimes of my own. Or do I, do I find myself tearing those down, tearing down those pretenses, tearing down those validations, tearing down those things, and, and, and really surrendering myself in, in, in Jesus and knowing that, that Jesus is, is the only thing. And then longing with the same compassion that God has, that Jesus had, that, that, that he wants these people to know him and to follow him. So in verse 21 it says, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Did you catch that? That's a pretty strong verse. This righteousness from God comes through what? Faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. I don't have to accomplish all the things that the law says. I have to have faith and I have to believe. And I have to do that in a crucified body, surrendered and submitted to the Spirit of God. That is righteousness. And, and it doesn't stop there. Sometimes it's just like, oh, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come back. Come back, Jesus. Come back. Keep me safe. Protect me. Come back. But the fact of the matter is, is that I'm supposed to be a light in the darkness. I am supposed to be salt to the world. I'm supposed to be different. I'm supposed to be set apart. I'm supposed to allow Jesus to live through me and to draw people to him. I'm going to be persecuted and I'm going to be treated the same way that Jesus was treated. Are we okay with that? Is there buy-in on our part? Is there buy-in? Do we, do we want that? Do we expect that? Paul says here, at the end of verse 22, there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He says there's no difference between these three groups, is there? It's all the same. All three groups, all the same. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice, because in His forbearance, His patience, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. There's the, the whole crux of Romans in this letter to the church in Rome. And that is the same thing for us where we find ourselves today. Paul is saying to you, there is no difference in any of us in this world today. No difference. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's only through the atonement of Jesus' blood 
that we can be saved. Amen? And that is available to any who, through faith, believe. Correct? It's available to any. And as people that have embraced that faith and have believed and now receive the righteousness that comes from God and to walk by faith, we have been called to be set apart, to be different, to not fit in. In the last days, the scripture says, people will surround themselves with people that tell them what their itching ears want to hear. We are not those people that people are going to want to surround themselves with because we are not going to be saying the things that they want to hear. We are not going to be welcome. We are not going to be wanted. We are not going to be the life of the party. Where then is boasting? Paul's coming head on right now. Because they were boasting about their circumcision. They were boasting about the things that they felt that they had earned, that they they deserved, or because they were special, because they were chosen, the Jews, right? Right? Here comes Paul. Where then is boasting? It's excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith? Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So, a little silly exercise that I felt led to do uh, as we were worshiping this morning is, uh, I'm going to steal a couple of these chairs, is that right, Jerry? Nope, I'm good, good. Do you mind if I take this one? Sorry. Eric, you care if I take a couple of your chairs? I won't take the one you're leaning on. Hopefully that's not trying to keep you awake. I'm just... When I'm outside the circle of Jesus, I walk in pride. Pride that thinks that I'm something without him. And, and sometimes I think in our lives, we try to, we kind of live in that, that outer realm. Well, I can handle this, or that's not that big a deal, or, or you know, I'm all right, I'll make it through this, or I can overcome but, but Paul says there's no difference. See, I told you I broke my glasses. Paul said there's no difference. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I think there's this fear, church. There's this fear of, of sin. Exposing sin. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I think the power of God is going to start to really manifest itself when we really learn how to confess and be transparent. And I'm not saying that that has to happen in a larger body, but it has to happen in the body. And I'm just going to tell you right now, in my life I've struggled with lust. But I'm going to tell you that through Jesus Christ, I overcome. 
through prayer, through accountability, through disciplines, fasting. Fasting has been an incredible tool that God has used. Am I perfect? No. But is there victory in Jesus Christ? Yes. And so when I proclaim that and I step into this circle of Christ, is there anyone that wants to join me in that circle? You know, there's going to be different people on a different stage of that journey. There might be some that are in the thick of it and they haven't felt like they've overcome. And that they just are at their wit's end. There might be some that be like, yes, I did struggle with that, but not anymore. Praise the Lord. And there might be some that's like, maybe they don't know they're struggling with it. Maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it's something that it's just, they don't care. But this is being the body of Jesus. This is what Paul was writing to the room and church about. Not getting hung up on pretenses of what you believe and how you believe it and what you practice and all those type of things. He was calling them to humility. Getting back to the core basic of that it's, it's a gift of grace and mercy that God has given for those who through faith believe and then receive righteousness of God and then begin to walk in obedience submitting to the Holy Spirit you follow? Is there anyone that wants to join me in this circle this morning? Anyone else? We're going to pray. So as, as we sit in this circle here, us as brothers, and, and those of you that are observing this circle, like, what, what can we do? What can we do? Well, of course you can pray. Okay, you can pray. But I'm, 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 just, I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be blatantly honest here, okay? Ladies, watch what you wear. Choose wisely. You don't need to portray beauty because God has made you beautiful. I don't need to see it. I don't. Be innocent in what you wear. Be innocent in the way you conduct yourselves. Guys, surround us. Support us. Encourage us. Okay? But this brothers and sisters, is, is getting at the root, the root of, of what Jesus came to do to set us free. Okay? And this is what the world needs. The world doesn't need doctrine. The world doesn't need rules and regulations. They need victory over sin. And forgiveness of sin. And if we as believers can't be transparent in sin, how will the rest of the world know that we needed Jesus? Right? Because they're not going to think they need Jesus if we never act like we needed Jesus. Or we never tell people why we needed Jesus. Or acknowledge that we did need Jesus. 
You know, there's a whole lot in Romans that we're going to talk about. But I'm just going to tell you that this is the core of what Paul's desire was as he wrote to several different churches. It's about humility, of understanding that we are nothing without Jesus. But we are children of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus and adopted into his kingdom forever. So we're going to pray. I'm going to pray with these guys, and then we're going to pray together, okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Father, forgive us. Help us to forgive others. Father, protect us from the evil one. I pray for these men in this circle right here, Father, that you will just empower them, give them victory in Jesus' name. Pour over them, Father, your abundant presence. And Father, I pray that you will establish a confidence and a boldness in each of these men so that they can understand that their battle is not against flesh, but it's against the principalities and powers of this dark world. And Father, that your word will bind those powers, will bind them. We ask you to do that in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for each one in this room that you will help us to stand in humility on our knees and just truly every day posture ourselves knowing that we are nothing without Jesus, but yet with Jesus we are something that is incredibly special, and that is your child. Father, help us not to be caught up on physical differences, but to be set apart because Jesus, you have made us different. Help us to walk in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.